The 11 were returning to Nelson Bay when their Haynes Hunter clipped an oyster lease at the mouth of the Mile River. Only a few kilometres from last week's tragedy, they claimed the lives of five children. They were among 49 people who boarded a cruiser designed for less than half that number, prompting police and water authorities to warn of the dangers of overcrowding. To the still grieving region of Port Stephens, this morning's tragedy was a case of deja vu. You've been on the water for quite some time. In your opinion, do you think 12 people is too much for a boat like this? Well, I'd have to say, I'd be telling lies if I said it wasn't too much. There's far too many in the boat, but the source. After clipping the oyster leash near Corrie Island around midnight, the boat sank, throwing the 10 men aboard into the water. Terry Slade and his family were moored nearby and got the shock of their lives when two men swam in out of the darkness. We were, we were sitting on the back of the boat and me and Terry, we, we just heard people swimming up yep. beside the boat and Terry goes, quick, go and alert someone. And we all, well, we got these two up, we started both engines and then just gradually kept on picking them out of the water. They did the trip up there when they originally went up to um, Tea Gardens, they did the trip up there in two trips and they came back, they came back in one trip. How, how foolish is that? You know, that's stupid. The uh, water came over the over the back of it and it just went down like a down like a ball, like a rock. And they, when we got there, well, all, all there was was the boat, but there wasn't much more of it sticking up. Just the nose of it was sticking up out of the water. And the police boat towed it and put it on a channel marker and tied it there. And it wasn't until we searched for a number of hours, I wouldn't have a clue how many, but we searched for a lot of time and uh, then, then we went back to um, back to find back and anchored off the boat and just shone the light on it till they moved it and that was when she came out. It's believed 44 year old Leslie Waddell like the five children who died last week was trapped in the cabin as the craft sank. The three Sydney men and seven from Nelson Bay escaped with only shock and hypothermia. The inquiry into the death of the well-known Hawks Nest woman will now become a joint operation between police and the MSB. Boating Services Officer for Port Stephens, Jim West, says it's an unfortunate way for people to realise the importance of boating regulations. Just talking to people and people's opinions over the last week, I'd say they've learned a great lesson and I think they will, the right people who uh, do care will take notice. The concert began at 10 o'clock this morning and a constant crowd of around 300 surrounded the stage. While the weather remained cool, entertainers did their best to keep the crowd amused. Super Hubert did everything but pull a money-waving crowd from under his cape. Like Macquarie Mayor, Ivan Welsh modelled the latest in Quake shirt designs. All money raised from the sale of the commemorative shirts will go to the Lord Mayor's relief appeal. Old time favourites Little Paddy and Brian Davies got the crowd into a good move, building out some refreshing tunes. While crowds were down through the day, it's expected they will lift tonight for a rock concert starting at 7 o'clock, hosted by New FM's John Paul Young, before a giant closing fireworks spectacular at 10 o'clock. Mr Carr's comments come hot on the heels of the coroner's finding on the Grafton bus crash in which 20 people died. Today the state and federal governments continue to argue over who should foot the $1.6 billion to upgrade Pacific Highway to the dual carriageway, recommended by the coroner. I think the first thing is that state and federal governments should stop squabbling over whose responsibility is. The public simply wants this most dangerous stretch of road in Australia to be improved and to get that dual carriageway that's inevitable as soon as possible. He said Premier Nick Griner is planning to build a new office block behind Parliament House overlooking the Sydney domain for himself and other ministers. 
the taxpayers of New South Wales are being asked to put $60 million into luxurious new accommodation for Mr Griner and Mr Murray. I'm saying cancel that project and sink the money into a dual carriageway, an immediate start on building a dual carriageway on the Pacific Highway on the North Coast. Mr Carr was holding a shadow cabinet meeting at Belmont, being briefed on the rebuilding of Newcastle after the earthquake, plus issues affecting Lake Macquarie. Of most concern to representatives of the United Residents Groups for the Environment of Lake Macquarie was a park system for the area, to include land at Caves Beach, Green Point and Morissette Hospital grounds. We're going to do more work with the local conservationists to work out a plan that we'll go to the people with at the next election for urgent open space acquisitions in this area. I mean, in the past, uh, state governments have put money into acquiring open space around Sydney Harbour. Um, the open space uh, along, the, along the river in Newcastle's uh, CBD is very important as well. It's now important in the 1990s to turn our attention to Lake Macquarie. In the city centre, part of Hunter Street was closed to traffic today after a three-storey building threatened to topple onto the roadway. The building which houses Porky's Pizza Bar was under repair for earthquake damage, but last night's storm loosened the main sandstone block. Workmen repairing the roof noticed the parapet hanging precariously over the footpath. The inside lane was closed to traffic between Steele and Merriweather Street, and tonight only one carriageway is operating. The lane will remain closed until council engineers assess the building. This is where sewage overflow from the King Street pumping station is finishing up. Cottage Creek then into Newcastle Harbour. Electric pumps at the station were flooded in recent rains and yesterday they stopped completely, leaving engineers with no option but to redirect the flow. The water board says record rainfall since Saturday has pushed the system beyond its limits, with storm water lines spilling into sewerage lines, creating an uncontrollable flow. Residents in the Islington, Mayfield and Ties Hill areas are suffering as a direct result. More than 500 properties have been flooded with sewage and stormwater backing up through their pipes. I think this office just everything's gone haywire for the amount of rain and that that we've had and it's not going to go anywhere. So it just has to fill up in the yard. Compounding the problem, the Burwood Beach Treatment Station is working at only 75% of its capacity. The system should pump nearly 6,000 litres per second. It is only performing to 4,600. The extra load has nowhere to go, but overflow outlets into streets and eventually the ocean. I mean, how much sewage was getting into the ocean? Well, I'd say about 20% of our system was going, going, was disappearing through those means. But they only and for how long was that happening? For about on Saturday night, we think for about two hours. Um, the, la the last few nights has probably been for about an hour. The Water Board says it's the first time the new Burwood Beach plant has been run at full capacity and engineers will be inspecting pumps to find out why the system failed to function to its specifications. The Board hopes to replace pumps in the King Street station by midday tomorrow. Love them or hate them, the game of football can't be conducted without them. It's not the highest paid job in the world, or one where the accolades flow freely. But the men who are about to embark on a season as a member of the Newcastle and District Rugby League Referees Association wouldn't want to do anything else during the footy months. With the pace of the game increasing every year, the fitness level of our referees has taken on a new meaning. At Dudley Oval, the lads who will be in charge of local fixtures this year groaned and grunted under the weight of summer cheer, and with the start to the season just around the corner, it was a timely reminder that there's plenty of work still to be done. To help them find the necessary energy, the referees were pleased to find that their sponsor for 1990 is the Newcastle Banana Merchants, and General Manager of the Newcastle Rugby League, Tom Ellis, was on hand to oversee the handing over of the cheque from Cole McWilliam to the President of the referees, Paul McBlain.
The deluge of the past week and a half has turned the valley's picking schedule upside down. Mechanical harvesters are next to useless in these conditions, so it's a return to the days of old with hand pickers. And it's hard work out here. Pickers have no choice but to trudge through the slippery mud, their buckets weighed down by the moisture-laden fruit. Despite the extremely boggy conditions, most winemakers remain optimistic, hopeful that the quality of the fruit won't be affected by the big wet. The flavour that we do have is very good, even though it's a little light, it's still good quality. There's, as I said, there's no deterioration, there's no mould character in any of the juices, so we're looking pretty good at this stage. For the moment, most vineyards are concentrating on picking the Semillon variety. The harvest is taking place ahead of optimum ripeness, but with their soft, thin skins, these grapes are most susceptible to disease. The Semillon skins may start splitting and the juice from the grapes will start running down over the bunches. And If you've got the conditions there that you've got the spores for mould and fungus, well, uh, it'll start up and... Uh, uh, go through the bunches uh, fairly quickly. It's a very difficult time, very inconvenient time, a stressing time, but uh, we're getting there and if the weather holds uh, we should be okay. But as storm clouds hang ominously over the vines, more heavy rain could spell problems in controlling disease. In the worst case, uh, I guess that uh, a lot of decisions will be made and it will be a matter then of going out and uh, uh, getting the crop in as uh, quickly as we possibly can. Yes, thanks Mick. Here we are, the 9th of February, and the Knights and the Eels are already fighting it out here at the ISC. Despite the fact that it's summer, conditions are good here, temperatures not too hot, and I'm sure the, pl the players are appreciating that. Uh, reserve grade finished about half an hour ago, and the Knights had a resounding win, 34 points to 12, with new boy Marty Croker having a terrific game. Well, first grade started about uh, half an hour ago, and uh, with both sides getting into the form they've become famous for. The Knights have been doing it tough with Sam Stewart, Glanville and Mark Sargent running the ball up. The Eels with Sterling directing play are throwing the ball out to the back line to players like Kenny and Leeds. Coach Alan McMahon has been stressing through the week that it's simply a trial and we're expecting the lineups to change throughout the game. Well, conditions are getting darker here at the ISC. The score is six all and the 5,000 crowd are getting ready for a big season of rugby league. that coalface of implementing that change, in many cases have had the hard part of it to date, can start welcome the, uh, the comments that have been coming from your, uh, yourself and your minister. It was not all plain sailing for the PM. Arriving at the Maitland Road building, he had to run the gauntlet of noisy pilots protesting over the awarding of $6 million in damages against their federation. The greeting upstairs was far more cordial, a standing ovation from delegates to the week-long policy-making conference of the FIA. In his opening address, Mr Hawke paid tribute to the resilience shown by Novocastrians after the earthquake, comparing that favourably with their ability to perform in commerce and industry. Acknowledging an imminent election, but still refusing to divulge the date, the Prime Minister blasted the coalition, saying it nearly caused the demise of Australia's steel industry. But his accord turned that around. As we go into this election, as you know, wages uh, policy and industrial relations will stand at the very heart of the differences between ourselves and the opposition. FIA National Secretary Steve Harrison, in response, urged Mr Hawke to push for a Taiwanese steel mill here, a topic the Prime Minister took up at a later news conference. And you've got the indication of the uh, commitment of the uh, working people of this uh, region, the trade union movement, uh, and our commitment 
then uh, the best possible environment has been uh, created. I understand uh, that from some developments within Taiwan uh, that they may not be as close now to making a decision uh, as had been contemplated before, but if they are going to move offshore in any way, uh, Australia in general and Newcastle in particular is where they should come. The FIA conference, held each three months, will cover all aspects of the union's activity from the aluminium smelting industry to steelworks in all states of Australia. A landslide caused by the continuing rain in the Port Stephens area has forced two Corlett families to flee from their damaged homes. One of the dwellings in Canangra Avenue was shifted from its foundations, while the house above on the steep hill is in danger of collapsing. The lower house, owned by Peter Marshall, has partly sunk into the mud, causing cracks in the brickwork and damaging other parts of the structure. It's worth about $300,000 and the owner may have to demolish it because of the extensive damage. The house above, owned by Bruce and Joan Addison, is supported by props to stop it from slipping down the muddy hill. Engineers spent the day trying to place concrete blocks around the house to prevent further movement. This building could be saved. There are also anxious moments in Madison Drive at Adamstown Heights where two backyards are sliding into a nearby street. The two-storey house is owned by Frank DeVitas, who says the recent deluge has further weakened the earth and he now has only three metres of his backyard left. Next door, a house is being built, but most of its backyard has also disappeared. Engineers are prodding in the mud to find a solid foundation for a retaining wall. It's hoped this structure will arrest the landslide as well as the worries of the two homeowners. The hold-up attempt took place in the early evening of January 25 when a man in his mid-twenties entered the Fennel Bay Cellars bottle shop. A young assistant was working in the store. She told police the man waited for a short while before suddenly approaching her. He demanded money, then, to the assistant's horror, he produced a flick knife. Despite the potential danger, the young victim refused to cooperate and fled. He followed, but was surprised by another woman who'd been working in a rear storeroom. Outnumbered, the would-be assailant lost his nerve and ran. Although he left empty-handed, police say they view the offence as extremely serious. He came into the shop and uh, confronted the shop assistant, produced a knife on the shop assistant with the intent to uh, take money. But uh, he was disturbed during the incident and decamped. Although he took no money during this, uh, the matter is still considered serious. The man police are looking for is described as 173 centimetres tall of thin build with dark straight hair. At the time of the robbery, he was wearing a red and white striped shirt and blue jeans. If you believe you know this man or his whereabouts, police would like to hear from you now on the Crime Stoppers hotline 008 422 199. There is a reward of up to $1,000 for information leading to an arrest. The number once again is 008 422 199. One double nine. Today's match was a minor final in the statewide schoolboys competition for the prestigious Alan Davidson Shield. Having won a berth in the Hunter final, both Gloucester and Walls End were assured a place in a playoff between the top 16 teams in the state. 
Nevertheless, today's match was important, carrying the prize of the Jim de Corsi trophy and the title of the top hunter side. The game had already been washed out twice and Wall's End must have been praying for nature to intervene again as the Gloucester bowlers attacked. Greg Pearson took three for 17, helping confine Wall's End to just 81. Gloucester then took the crease and had little trouble topping that score with the loss of just two wickets. Michael Gerritz made 25, Craig Rosenborn was not out on 34.